So, Pastor Kevin, we're thankful for you. We're thankful for the ministry that the Lord has given you, and we need to give you a warm welcome as Pastor Kevin comes to deliver the word. Okay? Good morning. morning. We're almost on. Almost. Testing, testing. A little bit more. We're good? We're hot and live. All right. Well, good morning. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. And we're just going to jump right into it. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. And we're also going to stand for one other reason today, as you stand. We're going to talk about Speed the Light. And you may think, Pastor Kevin, that was two Sundays ago. I got like 50 more to wait before we start talking about it again. No, we don't. Because we got to talk about what happened. In the bulletin last week, it said that there was around $8,200 in change given. And that in and of itself would have been been a record and I made mention last week and that it was that's just a, a, a subtotal there's an addendum would you guys like to hear the addendum yeah. very good so in and of itself the auction brought in twelve thousand dollars Yeah, that's unreal. That's really unreal because we thought 8,000, that's great. And even if you were in the the silent auction or if you were in here, if you were in here, you saw some fireworks. If you were in the silent auction, you saw a lot of items, but at the same time, it wasn't as much as perhaps years past. We thought, "Hmm, we'll see what God does. Then, $12,000, there was a donation made in the amount of $15,000. So all told, that Speed the Light Sunday, over $27,000 got brought in. And so we're standing, it's not so much an attaboy or a pat on the back, and those are all good. We shake hands, we say thank you for baking, thank you for making, thank you for bidding and supplying monies, but for the purpose of making sure that those people out in the world, whether they're in traffic situations, they've endured natural disasters, they need clean drinking water, or simply they are in a country like Turkey that once used to be a... once used to be a largely populated Christian country, incredibly seldom that people come to Christ in that country. Countries that were once filled with light have now gone dark, and that is why we speed the light to get light into dark places. Can everyone say amen? Amen. Amen. Well, let's get into the word this morning. You can turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. I was hoping that as we were standing, we'd get louder, and we did. That's good. It's on you version. It'll be on the screen. I'll say screens, but screen behind me. Uh, you can follow along in your Bible as well. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we receive, ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort in salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Father, this morning, as we read your word, in this moment, Father, we ask that your word has its effect in our minds. Father, that it sinks deep into our hearts, that our emotions and our logic, Father, they are churned together and your spirit moves us. Father, you give us ideas, you give us concepts, and Father, maybe you reveal something to us about ourselves that we've kind of been putting off for quite a while. Father, would you encourage us and draw us to yourselves this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord will bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Pastor Cal mentioned the the series gift exchange that we've been doing, and today we're talking about going from hurt 
to healing, and that, that specifically is, is God's healing. And I was talking with my mom earlier in the week, and she goes, oh, well, what are you going to talk about? And as I was about to tell her, just real briefly, a sentence or two, I was thinking, this could be like a, a mini-series, like a whole semester of hurts and healing and diving into it. And so this morning, we do not have an entire semester. What we're going to look at this morning is pointing out the purpose of the pain that we go through sometimes. The struggles that we go through, the striving, there's a purpose behind it. And if we rely on God, we can learn the product that comes out of it, what is produced in us. So all that to say, I think it's fair and obvious that we acknowledge we all have bad days. If you are so willing to admit that within the last 12 months you have had a bad day, would you raise your hand? Okay, we're going to narrow it down. If you would be so bold and willing as to admit that perhaps in the last month you have had a bad day, raise your hand. Yep, this is easy. And if you're in the balcony, you get a pretty good view of hands sprouting up. What about last week? Any bad days last week? Yeah. Is any... No, I, I would ask the question, is anyone in a bad day today? However, the day isn't over. And you have a really good start coming in here right now. And what we take away from here, whether it transpires in the altar, whether it hits us hard in our seats, or maybe something is coming down the road. We pray it doesn't, but as we're going to learn, trouble and hard times are divine appointments in the eyes of the believer. God, who is above all things and sees all things and nothing happens without his particular assignment and permission, we learn that if it comes, God is there all the more. And we're going to take a look at that today. So if something is coming down your road, maybe you sense it, maybe you know there's going to be a, a really tough conversation to have later on today or tomorrow. Please, let's dial in right now and let's see and let's dive into God's word and see what he has for us. Because as we're going to learn today, what we take away for us is not just for us. We carry it with us in the future. And specifically in this passage, we see how it is so future bound. I'm going to list a couple things that may describe a bad day for you all. You learn that your car requires expensive repairs. You can nod your head with me if that is a bad day for you. Or at least bad news. We can admit to that. Car accident. Never fun. Injuries. You stub a toe. Anyone ever stubbed a toe? Everyone says, anyone ever broken a toe because you stubbed a toe? Oh, it's infuriating. And you can't do anything. It's just a toe. Snip it off. You can't do it, but you got to heal it up. Bad day. Unemployment. Not great. Struggling with fertility, with conceiving. How about parenting? Taking care of babies. Tough, right? Especially if you've never done it before. Or if you have done it, each one's different. Toddlers. They're starting to get a will of their own, and they're learning language and learning how to use it slash not use it. How about terrible twos? Anyone ever had any experience with that? How about a three-nager? You guys know what that is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we raise our hand. Yeah. We love our children. Three-nagers. They're three. They act like teenagers and all that that can encompass right there. Or how about just teenagers? That's unique right there. Or how about young adults? And if you're a parent, you watch your young adult perhaps grow, and you're like, man, they're doing great. That's a little knuckle shiner. I taught them all I, all I did. And then they make a choice that you yourself would not necessarily make. That's tough. You have to be able to help walk them through that, and hopefully they do allow you to help walk through that. Or perhaps at this time of the year, we see the lights up, we have the Christmas tree out there, and we have the palm tree in here. We're, we're branching out, literally. <laughs> this time of year can stir up a lot of emotions and a lot of past hurts, and that just sometimes a song, perhaps even a smell, uh, a sight, maybe even a chill in the air, unfortunately, those disappointments can get stirred up and relived. Those are examples of what a bad day could be. And there's a variety of others, but we'll, we'll keep it in the ballpark there. Paul had some bad days as well. Would you like to hear about them? Good. Let's put it in perspective. This is not a silver lining. It's not a, well, at least you're not this. We're going to learn why we're going to compare here in just a moment. So we're going to do a little experiment. If 
you would be so willing is to close your eyes. Everyone close your eyes. And maybe even bow your head. We're not going to pray. We're just going to do an experiment. I'm going to list some things that Paul went through. And if you yourself have gone through them, feel free to raise your hand. Okay? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have known and been cold and naked. We can open our eyes and put our hands down at this point. That's a unique experience for one man. That reads like some sort of odyssey right there. And if you've ever read the odyssey, it's, it's wild. There's a lot of stuff going on. But even so, you see Paul here has gone through his steps himself. It's safe to say that he has suffered, right? I think it's more accurate to say that he has suffered because of his allegiance to Jesus. The question comes, and even I say it, I say, so this is Paul we're talking about. This is not me, this is Paul, one of the major apostles in the New Testament, church planter extraordinary. There must have been something unique, something other, something supernatural, something special about him that God is keeping him alive and through all these things. That's biblical. How practical and relevant is that for today? I could say that to myself, you could say that to me, we could say it to each other. Perhaps we haven't been through any of those things. I looked down that list and I said, zero. Zero. The shipwreck thing is, is mind-boggling in and of itself. The beating part, the lashes, the stones, the rods, zero. And perhaps we haven't been through it. But that's not the point of the comparison. The point of this comparison that Paul makes is the way out of those sufferings. Not the fact that we can compare them. Here's my list, here's your list. You win first prize. It's what is the way out of it. Paul just happens to list the big ones here. There's others. He lists the big ones so that people can understand that what they're going through, though it may not compare in its magnitude, the way out is still the same for him and for us. Now, I may have mentioned the word before, and I'm going to mention it here. The cure for our hurts, the healing that is there. And as I was looking at this passage in scripture that we read in 1 Corinthians 1, as I was reading it over and over, sometimes you just get a feeling, and you can't help but not think of it a certain way. And as I was thinking, I was reading, and I was looking at different sources, and I thought, I think it's okay for me to look at this way. And here's what it was. I was beginning to think as if I actually had a physical hurt. I was in the hospital. There was something wrong with me, and this is more of a medical type thing. And so today, when we look at this scripture, I encourage you, because I'm encouraging myself, let's look at God's role in our lives as a fatherly divine physician. Now, we know he's our divine physician. He heals, and he came to heal and to save us from sins. He came for the sick, not the healthy. So today, we're going to look at ourselves in that way. He is our fatherly divine physician. And here's what we need to know. First, number one, he's our fatherly divine physician. He keeps his appointments. And I'll even add on to it. It's not up there, but I'll add on to it. And takes all walk-ins. So this morning, if you say, I haven't been to church, this is not a regular thing for me. This is not a standing appointment, and you're a walk-in. Or maybe you run into someone, as we're going to find in the future, that has not had much of a regular opportunity to have a relationship with God, or maybe they've put it off or run from it. God takes walk-ins too. Paul describes him as this, the father of compassion, there's our fatherly, and the God of all, the God, no, I'm going to stand back, the God of all comfort. That's his description, and what is unique about that, the word all, it's not a limited thing. 
It's unending. Compassion and comfort. He has it. And he has inexhaustible resources for anyone who's ever breathed or lived on this earth. And we would say yes and amen and that is good. And at the same time, we have neighbors. We have relatives. We have friends. Uh, we have family members who hurt us badly. And to think, yes, God, I need your comfort. And yeah, they need, their, you, they need your compassion because they're the sinner. They're, they're the ones who did wrong. They need exactly what we need. And we need exactly what they need. Because if we don't have it, if this all becomes fragmented and some, this qualification for how this happens isn't universal. And it becomes this, I have to do something in order to earn it. I have to qualify because it's not just so broad. But he's the father of all compassion and the God of all comfort. One of the harder th truths that you see spelled out in people's writings who have followed God for a long time, whether it's a biography, a memoir, just a book, is this. Trouble is not an accident. For every believer, it is a divine appointment. And we don't like, we don't like thinking that when we go through tough things, God knew it was coming and let us go through it. We don't like thinking that because it thinks, God, you could have spared me. You could have made this less or you at least could have given me a heads up. So even if it was unavoidable, I could be a little bit more prepared or maybe save someone else some of the pain and just, just keep it for myself. We have a hard time thinking that way as well. But what we're going to see here is that there is a purpose behind it and there is a product that is produced. So when God keeps his appointments, that means, and he takes walk-ins as well, that means comfort and compassion go right along. That means anytime we ask, anytime we present ourselves to him and are willing to rely on his comfort and his compassion, it's there. Here's a problem when we talk about this appointments. We talk about this prescription that God has for comfort and compassion. And we also happen to not live in a vacuum. There's no absence of other opinions. We live in this world, and there's a variety of other thought patterns and worldviews, is there not? If you just want to simply take a look at YouTube in and of itself, that's a Alice in Wonderland. I may have to abandon this. That is an Alice in Wonderland cacophony of random things happening there. There's amazing things. You can see footage of a giant squid, things that were never even known to us in, in real-time footage more than 15 years ago. Now you can see it. You can also see some really dumb things on there. And short note, parents, uh, if you have YouTube, make sure you have some sort of filters or a, a safety kid thing set up because there's a lot of things you can stumble to. It's also a unique thing. If you've ever been on YouTube, you see that sidebar of other videos, that sort of things, or like specially selected for you, whatever it may be. That is the power of suggestion, is it not? If you're watching yours and you could hear it, maybe you've just lost interest in the visual and you're scrolling down to see what's there, you're like, oh, that one, oh, that one, that one. And before you know it, you're 70 minutes into it. You're like, how did I just get into this? It's the power of suggestion. And so when we hear God's prescription for us as his comfort and compassion, we have to be fully aware and a little bit on alert that we live in this world that is so full of other opinions and other views, and it's so easy to get. The power of their views, their suggestions, are just a click away. So we have to be selective, do we not? We absolutely do. So God gives us this prescription of comfort and compassion. And on any other earthly doctor, if I go there, I think it's time. Is it time? It's time. All right. Very good. Are we free? We're free? All right. I'm going to officially turn this off. You go to any other doctor in the world and you get a prescription, it's for yourself, right? It's for you. If I go get something for poison ivy, this is for my poison ivy. If Rachel has healthy skin, this does not help her skin get healthier, right? That's for me in and of itself. If I get a new heart, Rachel, my wife, her heart doesn't get stronger because I have a new heart. That's for me. But what's unique about God's plan here is that it is yours. It helps you in the moment. You carry it in the future for your own perspective, but you are able to give it to other people. And we would expect nothing less from a God who is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipresent omnipotent, omnipresent, uh, what am I missing? 
That's it. I got them all. Right. He's all of those things. So if he gives a cure, why would it be limited? It would only be limited in its scope that he would specifically design it to be for you in that moment. And he's able to do it. But that comfort, because it's in him, it's not necessarily a Cal Garcia version. It's not an Eddie Tabor version. It's an in him. We see it in Christ. It's perfect for everyone coming after. So we know that this is coming forward down the line. We have a purpose behind us being comforted in our troubles. Here's what Paul says it once again. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. It sounds promising. It sounds practical. It also sounds, if you're with me, painful. Because there's a purpose behind it. We're going to walk through stuff. We're going to bless people down the road. We're going to gain endurance in the process. But there's pain for the now. That sounds painful. But is that really so uncommon that we would look at this everyday pain and think, this is so different than anything else? Here's an example. If you've ever toiled and labored in athletics or any sort of physical training, you know you're going to go from one to another to another, and you're going to grow and grow and grow. You're going to have sore muscles. You're going to be winded. You're going to have cramps. The coach is going to perhaps critique, maybe even criticize you, and get you to a place where you're better. At the end of it, your endurance is there. Not only that, your mental capacity for what to do and what not to do has grown as well. Musical instruments, if you've ever tried to master a musical instrument, you take lessons and you go from weird recorders that you get in third grade. Did anyone else get those? They sound bad, but I, I, they sounded bad because I played it. But then you go from that and you hear the sounds coming from the balcony this morning, that great group of horns welcoming us with the, the sounds of the season. They've taken care of the practice. They've grown in that. Or even my wife, who's a, an actor, you get those directors and producers. They were probably thespians themselves at one point. They've gone through the steps. They've learned how to deal with the emotional recall of a scene and be able to jump from one to the other. Or if you're in tech or any sort of the trades, and you start at the beginning, like this guy right here, and you're like, oh, a drill. I think I know what I'm doing. Short story. I decided to fix a door that was rubbing against the carpet, and I thought, oh, I'm just going to take some off the bottom. I'm sure there's a way for it, right? I'm sure there's a real simple way. Uh, I borrowed a Sawzall for that sort of thing. <laughs> guys, you're going to love this, especially the guys I went to CERN I'm with. This is why I didn't operate any saws. It's like a plywood door, like a little frame inside. I didn't clamp it down with anything. I think I put a foot on it out on the deck, had the sawzall, I drew a line. I'm confident now looking back, the line wasn't even even. And a sawzall is like this reciprocating blade that just goes back and forth. Sometimes it's called a reciprocating saw, I think. See, I know things. And it basically just chewed into the door to the point where Rachel's uncle, Uncle Sam, had to come when he came next and made it look a little bit better. And then we put a little cover over it. But she was watching me do it from the kitchen window and then she came out she's like what just happened is something to that degree like and I'm thinking I, I don't know if I had the right saw but I thought I could do it if you started in the trades at a low level like myself but then you've grown and when you see some of these things that happen I, this is not me by the way this is Matt Benarowitz or some of the things that we can accomplish like we did in Suriname the craftsmanship behind it is there not only for the moment you feel satisfied and accomplished and maybe you've even grown as a team but it's lasting it is something that you leave for somebody else we live in the homes we live in because someone built it well and left it for us so there's this future aspect as well so, when we look at that, we have to know that going through the pain, there's a purpose behind it. And the purpose of pain is to pursue God's comfort. And it may sound kind of funny, like, why would he just give us pain so we pursue him more? Why wouldn't he just woo us with good things so that we could pursue him more? Because there's an endurance that says that we take on. And when we have endurance, that means we're able to walk better and walk farther with God. Not necessarily without him. And if you've done any sort of biking, you start on the, the two wheels, training wheels, then you take the training wheels off, which is cool. Maybe a 10 speed, maybe I think there's a 17, I have a 21. And the more gears you have, the more efficient you get. But just because you have a, a high geared bike doesn't mean you can go very far. You have this great tool in front of you, but you still need to apply yourself in it and gain endurance. 
The purpose of pain is to pursue God. The product of pain is the perspective of endurance. And so when we look at number two, the first one is God keeps his appointments and then takes all appointments as well. Number two is this, God keeps his people in him. He keeps his appointments and he keeps his people in him. Would you, yeah, we'll do it. We'll raise your hand. If you have ever gone to the doctor and gotten a referral to go someplace else because the doctor wasn't quite able to do it for whatever reason, right? With God, he does not need to outsource any of his healing to anything else. It is all in him. And what's more, when he prescribes something, maybe you see it in his word and you have it for yourself and it becomes a comfort to you, guess what? That's now transferable to other people. Paul uses the word abound, which is really just awesome, that it would abound in Christ. Well, why does it abound? Why does it have to? He's not sloppy here, and he's not overly dramatic. Paul wants us to understand that the comfort and compassion that God gives is far more and greatly exceeds the pain that we will endure. It is there for us. We have this thing called the church. That's all the believers in the world, and we know Jesus is the head of it. And when we see in Colossians 1, and then you see it again in Ephesians 4, that we are held together in him. Paul here in this particular passage in 2 Corinthians is saying we are also healed together in him. Because if Cal Garcia has comfort, and he passes it along to me, which he has numerous times, I now get comforted. I now grow in my endurance as well, and I am kept in Jesus. I am held in him, and I am healed in him. And when it's all in-house, it doesn't need to be outsourced in any way, shape, or form. He says this, Paul, if we are distressed, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which produces patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. So if I have distress, it produces comfort in others down the line. If I have comfort, it still produces comfort on down the line. That's good. We just have to walk through this one part here, fully relying on God, and those other parts fall into place when we are obedient to him. How do we mess this up, though? Here's how I think we mess it up. We try to self-prescribe what we think we need. That thing, YouTube, or podcasts, they're great. There's a lot of good ones out there, but there's also a lot of ones out there that can tell you a lot of things. Daytime TV, man, it's out there. We self-prescribe what we think we need, what sounds good. Or maybe we think it's just a small little thing. You just chill out and you binge watch for a day. You totally disassociate it. And I am one for sitting on the couch and watching. I can do it with the best of them. But I also know why I'm doing it. What's my motivation between escaping and not really listening to the hurt and the pain that's there? I'm just washing it out. Or as Rachel and I have been discussing, washing out the white noise with white noise. We have to be real careful about that. So that's self-prescription, but then we do something else. Instead of going through the distress and passing on the comfort, or having the comfort and still passing on the comfort, when we're talking with someone, we pass on our distress, but we still take comfort in somehow passing it on. Have you ever talked with someone where you feel burdened? And I'm not talking about you've talked with someone and you're you're gonna walk through it with them, but they looked to simply just put it upon you and they feel so much better. In fact, the burden isn't so much a burden for them, they're comforted, but you're left with a mess, one way, shape, or another. That's kind of toxic, that's twisted, that's backwards. That's how we end up messing it up because we take it on ourselves and we think, I can play this divine physician role but we can't. This comfort produces endurance, and that's unique. It's endurance through hard times that provides us a perspective that we will need for the future. And I think that's one of the neatest things about this is that Paul points not only to the present, but to the future. And if you're like me, I like to know things that are gonna happen in movies. I love time travel movies. I like seeing what goes on in the past. And I think part of my personality anyways likes to deal with the past a whole lot more than the present. But then there's this idea of the future. I wanna know what's there. And if you were to say somewhere along the lines, as parents often do, well, when you get older, you'll need this or that. Or you'll believe this when you get older, this or that. That's part of it. This is his fatherly, divine physicianship helping us to be able to walk into the future with endurance, helping other people. 
still in the same office, still saying in-house. I mentioned to you before that although sufferings come at hard times, and your life may not compare to the YouTube highlight reel of disasters that Paul walked through. The point of that comparison is not to compare a car accident with two shipwrecks and lost at sea. We understand that those two can be quite different. The point of that comparison is to say this is the way out, whether you've been through all of my stuff or other stuff. And at the moment in 2 Corinthians there, you'll read on in a few more verses, He's walking through some really tough times. We don't know what it is. He doesn't mention it specifically. But you see it's mentioned on down to the point where he says this. But this happened, this thing happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So at the end of that verse 6 and 7, and Pastor Shannon, you can come on back. When it says, our hope for you is firm... That word hope has a special place in this season, doesn't it? A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. That word hope here is firm. Why is it firm? It's firm because it's on God who raises the dead. And oftentimes, guys, if you're like me, you tend to think of things that are final, that are dead. That's final. There's no going back. You have to walk away from it, whatever it is. But the idea of firm here is not about death. It's actually about life. That we have a God who conquers death. The verse after it talks about their hope. And we cannot get away from that idea of hope and the reality that God provides for us when we're talking about our hurts. Because sometimes there's some really dark days and all you have is hope because you're not seeing the healing just yet. We are held together in him. We are healed together in him. And week after week, when we have these altars open and people are down here praying, and people are praying for those people, or maybe you've been a person to pray for, being prayed with. Maybe there's tears. Maybe it's just a a solemn, quiet moment. When we have moments like these, where we allow people to walk beside us in these harder times, it allows us to heal together. Because the comfort that someone may have in praying, that's from God. And we trust that he is working in these moments. We trust that our flesh is, has already been put away. And that these moments here, whether we're on our knees, whether we're standing, whether we're with someone, maybe we're even still in our seats. Allowing people to comfort us is part of God's healing process. He keeps his appointments. He doesn't miss a one. And it's entirely possible today that there's an appointment for some of us here down at the altar, maybe there in our seats, maybe in the foyer or even the coffee shop, where there needs to be an appointment with God and maybe even with someone else that can provide the comfort we need. Maybe you're a private person. Maybe you don't like sharing details or burdening other people with your problems, with your things. I get that. I really do. I'm a private person myself. But I also know that if that goes unchecked, I tend to suffer alone. And on the inside, it just starts to crumble a little bit until it gets even worse and worse and worse. And I know at that point, I'm really entering into a place of neutrality. I can't provide the comfort that I once had. I can't provide it if I don't receive it. And if we look at it that way, it takes the selfishness out of asking for prayer. Because you know it's going to be given out of you at some point. You know that. So stand with me this morning. As we approach this time at the altar, hurts and healings, there's a purpose behind it, and that is so we pursue God's comfort. We know him more. And the product that we have through pain is this enduring perspective. Number one, that God's on the throne. Number two, that his comfort through us, that keeps in us, will go through us. And it's for his glory. Because at the start of that verse three, it says, all praise to God. We sang it today. It's all for your glory. And that's tough to think about. How does this result in praise to God? 
How does me going through pain and, and feeling God's comfort result in glory and praise to God? Does the situation in Syria change? Not yet. Situation in Washington? Not yet. But God gets glory sometimes that people don't even see. And what's important is that we are obedient in these moments to follow through on what he's asked us to do, this encouragement that Paul gives us. We are held together in him. Let's be healed together in him this morning. And after we pray, I'll invite you down the altars and our prayer partners will come. And if you come and you stand down here, one of those prayer partners, they will come quick. They will pray with the last, hey, how can we pray this morning? Something as simple as that. If you want to do business with God on your knees, please do that as well. If you want to take a friend who's standing next to you, maybe the whole family, do that. Come on down. There's strength in numbers sometimes. But we can't miss this opportunity to start healing when we are hurting wherever we are. Father, would you help us today? As we have this time of prayer, Father, as we look to say, God, your word speaks, how does my life line up with it? Father, would you remind us today that there is comfort in all troubles, for all situations, and that it abounds through your son. We are kept in you. Father, would you help us to rely on your power, not on our own human wisdom or the, the trinket type thoughts that we may pick up in the modern media. Father, would you help us if we've missed the boat and we've decided to ignore the hurt that's going on and try and wash it out with white noise. Father, would you forgive us? Would you help us to pursue your comfort today? Father, your word speaks better of us than we could ever speak of ourselves. So Father, today, as we worship and as we pray, as we come and as we interact with you wherever we're standing, Father, would you give us incredible mercy and grace? Would you let your Holy Spirit move us here and move on us? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Pastor Shannon will lead us. The altars are open and prayer partners, please be available to pray with those who come forward.